Uh, Will, if you would uh, be so kind as to uh, uh, take over and introduce our speaker for today. Be my pleasure, Bill. Before I do, I want to thank Joe for his impromptu endorsement of our speaker and also say that you know you're on the right track when people are coming to your club just because they want to hear the program and the speaker. So, Joe, thank you for that. So who is it? It's Ray Hunt. He's the executive director of the Houston Police Union. Officer Hunt is a native Houstonian. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. Degree in government. He served as a HPOA board member, HPOU secretary, oh. the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Officer Standards and Education. I've never heard of that before, but maybe he can tell us about that. He's been on the force for over three decades, and he has, I think, a lot of interesting stuff to say. So let me turn it over to you, Ray. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, let me first by saying I'm very happy to see Joe. Joe and I did work together for a long time. And Kathy, I, I can't imagine what your checkbook looks like or your budget looks like because I know how particular Joe is. But I, not, nothing's off topic today. Y'all can ask me any questions you like about the police department, about the union, or about the legislative session. I believe Will wanted me to bring up a few of the highlights from the session, which uh, I just got back from last night. And as you know, the 87th legislative session ends on Monday. Thank God that we only meet every other year for six months because I can't imagine having to do this around the clock, but it, uh, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of time. Your senators and representatives don't get paid very much money. And I assure you that at least on three or four nights, we were there till 3.30 in the morning, starting at about 10 in the morning uh, on just debating bills and going around and around on different issues. The big one that everybody's talking about is, is uh, HB 1927, which is basically the, the permitless carry that we're calling. We're not calling it constitutional carry because, uh, quite frankly, um, I already believe that we have constitutional carry with the LTC uh, that allows anybody who's a U.S. citizen to apply for a license. And as long as you do a background check and you're, you're saying you don't have any chemical dependencies, you're allowed to carry a gun anywhere you want. Uh, we had initially been a hard no on this topic, the HPO you had. We sat down with uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick with all the law enforcement groups, and he asked us what could he do to bring us closer to the neutral part or at least to move the needle a little bit off of a, off of a hard no. I gave him five or six different things, and uh, within about three days, he had promised about four of those things. And so we went back to just a, a very cautious neutral. So the bill did pass, as you probably know. Um, that passed 82 to 62 in the House and passed 17 to 13 in the Senate. That's pretty much right down party lines with the Republicans voting for it and the Democrats voting against it. At least that's what it was in the in the Senate. So uh, we had to, lots of other bills, the defund bill. We had uh, that, that one's passed so that municipal penalties can't defund the police unless they get the, the vote of the, of the voters in that in that town to say that they want to defund. A lot of folks said that this was a state overreaching by telling the cities what they could and could not do. I look at it just the opposite. It's giving them the ultimate authority to say, let the citizens in that city make a decision as to whether or not they want to defund the police through a vote of the citizens and not necessarily a vote of council. Because if you haven't seen Austin, Texas lately, Austin, Texas is a complete disaster. Uh, they've got tents all over the place. There's tents all over City Hall. Um, I will go nowhere in Austin without my pistol on me. And I would not possibly let my wife walk alone in Austin, Texas anymore. It's not, it's not a safe place. I very rarely see a police car now. They've cut back on their police dramatically. And uh, I think you're seeing very little proactive policing taking place because when you have a leadership like they have there in, uh, in the Austin uh, City Council, nobody's going to want to do anything. Fortunately, we have a mayor here who is very supportive of police. The mayor who heard folks talking about defunding the police from speaking down down in the, near the fountain up to, to his offices whenever we were deciding this. And not only did he not defund the police, he increased our budget and has recently added another cadet class on top of the five that we already have. So we're very fortunate to have a mayor that has least supported the police here in Houston. With that, anything you wanna ask me about the HPOU, about the city of Houston or any other topic that took place in the legislature, I'm, I'm completely transparent. I don't think I'll ever say I have no comment on that. 
Uh, I've been on a little over 31 years. My wife is begging me to retire, so I'm very unfiltered. <laughs> you are, Ray, you want to start with the low clearance rate on our crimes? Sure. We have very low clearance on especially homicides. We're looking at uh, around 50%. That's very scary. Uh, if any of you watch the news and What's you've seen... Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, about homicides and clearance rates on, on homicides. <coughs> um, we're going to probably, I hate to say this, but we're going to probably hit 500 homicides this year in Houston. We hit 400 last year. Uh, that, 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 those numbers are astronomical. That's, out, that's just incredible that we have in those, those kind of numbers. But uh, you've got a lot of folks out there, and the ones that are committing these, for the most part, are people who are out on no bonds, low PR bonds, or just multiple felonies. Uh, I just talked to an officer yesterday. He wrote, arrested a guy last night. Has seven felony bonds right now. He's out on seven felony bonds and was out here robbing again. Uh, if, you, if you listen to Andy Kahn on, on the, the news segment, I believe it's uh, uh, Breaking Bond on Fox 26, he uh, talks about of the, last year of the number of people who, who were murdered, close to 400, over 100 were killed by people who were out on PR bonds or, or on low-level low bonds. That's 100 people. Now, you think, okay, well, that's only a, a 25%. No, because we're only clearing 50% of the calls. So there's another 50% out there that goes to reason that we could easily have 200 people who were murdered last year on these same folks. It's going to continue until we get tired of it and say, we're going to put bad guys in jail and we're going to keep them in jail. The same going to be happening in Montgomery County to the north. You don't go out here and rob somebody and get on a PR bond. You rob somebody, if you got good probable cause, you're going to sit there in jail to your trial, and when you get sentenced, you're going to get 20, 30, 40 years in prison. It doesn't happen in Harris County. Was there anything in this legislative session about changing our bail bond structure? That's still, it may still get signed, but uh, I believe that it's going to be up to the judges again, the way that the, uh, the bond was, the, the bill was finally watered down. And uh, in Harris County, we've got we've got felony judges that uh, they they are not concerned about our safety. They're more concerned about about prisoners' rights than they are about victims' rights. And and as long as they continue to let people out, uh, they've got the protection all day long. But but the Joe citizen doesn't have that same protection. And and we're going to continue to have these problems as long as we're letting these people out or slapping them on the hand when they go out here and kill somebody. You, you, you just it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that we're continuing to do this, but that's what these judges are doing. They won't ever speak to the media. They say no comment or don't even let you in the courtroom. And they're able to sit back there and just wait for the next election. And people just go in there and punch a button and reelect them. It's very sad. You know, why do we uh, as a society have so many bad people? Why as a society, we have so many bad people. I don't believe we do. I believe we have 5% of every race that are bad folks. 95% of blacks are great. 95% of whites are great. 95% of Hispanics, browns, everybody. But that 5% is a lot of people who are committing these crimes. Uh, we, we know for a fact that the same group of people are the ones that are hitting these ATM machines all over the country. They're coming from right here in Houston, Texas. We, we, we have a task force that deals with this. And any ATM that gets hit, and when an ATM gets hit, we're not talking about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. We're talking about fifty to two hundred thousand dollars that they're getting in these ATM machines, and they're coming right back here to Houston, Texas, and nothing's happening to them. We can catch criminals out there on the street who have maps in their car that show the red lines of Harris County because they know that's where you commit the crimes or that's where you get caught. Because if you get caught there, you're not going to have to do the time. Ray, what about the backlog of cases to be tried? <laughs> Okay, you're going to probably hear in the next few months when these courtrooms are open back up that, that the district attorney has no choice but just to plea bargain every one of these out. You're talking about thousands of cases, thousands of cases that are backlogged. There were no trials taking place in the last year because of COVID, no trials before that because the courthouse had damage to it and was redoing it. You're going to just see people being dumped out of here on time served or on just deferred adjudication or whatever it may be. You're not going to be seeing these trials. They can't handle it. And remember, it just didn't stop at last year's. Every single day, it adds on top of that, on top of that, on top of that. You're never, ever going to get caught up. So you're going to see people dumped out of here on, on simple plea bargains for serious, serious crimes. And all that's going to do is drive the crime up further. 
which I guess is one of the good reasons why some of the folks on the on the far right said we need to be able to carry a gun regardless, because if we can't protect ourselves, nobody else is going to be able to protect us. And I'm just telling you, the police are responding to call, to call, to call. We're 1,500 officers short. That's not our numbers. That's the city of Houston's numbers. They did the study. They know what's going on. We are just simply being able to keep our head above water and being reactive and not proactive. Fortunately, our mayor and our chief allow us to still have a proactive unit. There is no proactive units in Austin, Texas anymore. We, live in a, we have a condo in a very nice area of Austin, right near the Capitol. Three doors down, a judge lives in the same condo that we do. The judge told me, hey, Ray, is there any way you can shut this marijuana house down? Two down on the right. You'll see him sitting down on the porch. I contacted the head of the Austin Police Officers Association. He said, we completely disbanded our, our, our uh, street-level narcotics unit. We have no street-level narcotics unit. We have not prosecuted a marijuana case buying or selling in over two years in Travis County. We don't even respond to the call. We're very close to that here. Ray, is, is that um, uh, reflective of the DA's position on this matter or? Um... It, the, the one in Austin is on the DA's position. The DA said, I'm not accepting any marijuana charges. So the police officers just aren't doing it. You, you pull somebody over and you smell, smell marijuana in the car and you just completely ignore it. Um, it it's, it's very, if you're even pulling someone over, because if you look at what's going on in this country right now, just put yourself in the shoes of a, of a police officer. Would you want to be self-initiating things to have contact with folks that you know that you're possibly one call from getting indicted? One call from, from making an error and, and pulling your taser instead of your gun and going to prison for 20 years? I, I mean, I, I can't imagine officers out there wanting to be proactive. And we as a union are prohibited from saying, stop doing anything. We don't want to say that. But we also know that, that these guys out here on the street, you're talking about at nighttime between 10 at night and 6 in the morning, you're talking about 21, 22, 23, 24-year-old kids out there keeping you safe while you're sleeping. That's, what's, that, that's who's protecting the city in the middle of the night whenever the, the, the worst of the worst are out there committing crimes. Ray, you got a question, but uh, first some context. Uh, Houston is the fourth largest city. It has the fifth largest police department. We reached our high point with a number of police officers in 2004 with 5,500, a little over 5,500. We have not been at that level since then. It has gone down dramatically. In fact, that one, it reached a low of 4,700 at one point. It's been coming back slowly ever since, but we're still not back where we were in 2004. Now, imagine how much Houston has grown in that period of time. So I'm happy to see that the mayor has added a six cadet class because it takes a long time to start ramping up and getting police officers back out on the street. My question, Ray, is are we filling the classes? Normally, there's about 70 per average in the class. No, no, we're not. Applications are down 60% nationwide to be a police officer, 6 -0. Nobody wants to be a police officer. Would you want your kid going out and applying to be a police officer? What's going on out there now? Uh, we're, we're getting somewhere between 45 and 55 to a class, and we're graduating somewhere between 47 and, and 50, somewhere around there in each class. But it's not because we're not trying. It's not because the mayor's not funding it. It's just because we, we can't get the quality candidates. I mean, uh, we, we are having to, we lower our standards, as you probably know, which I supported, because we used to require 60 hours of college before you could be a police officer. But in the last contract, we agreed to say, if you have two years of full-time work experience, they can substitute for the college. Also, if you have two years of military, it can substitute for the college, which I also fully support. But I don't think that college necessarily makes a better police officer. My brother's an outstanding police officer of 35 years. He's never had one college class. Uh, very good sergeant with, with our department. But no, Joe, it's, uh, it's difficult to fill the classes. If you got, if you got a, a person who wants to be a first responder, I would encourage them to join the fire department. Everybody likes farming. That shows how many people that carry a license gun to defend themselves. Are you saying to carry a license that, that defend yeah. themselves? Yeah, the people that, been, that carry a license gun been able to defend themselves against an intruder or you know somebody trying to rob them or. Yeah, well, there's 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 several hundred thousand licenses out there for LTCs, license to carry. But after September 1st, when this constitutional or permitless carry goes into effect, I think you're going to see a lot more. Um, I, uh, 
I can tell you that I, not only in Austin, but I never go anywhere without my pistol. Um, it's, I, I thank God have never had to pull it out off duty, but, uh, I, I have it there in the, in the event that that happens, but, uh, I would encourage anyone. I don't want you to carry a gun. If you're not comfortable in using that gun, I don't want you to carry a gun. If you're trying to put the bullets in the back way, which some people do when they're at these classes for LTC, uh, if you're not completely comfortable with using that weapon, I don't want you carrying it, but if you are, I don't ha have a problem with you carrying it. I would never carry it open. The open carry, we didn't fight it the last session whenever they, they passed it, but I think you're foolish to open carry. The only people who should be open carry is a police officer in uniform. If you're in a place and you're open carry, and the uh, I was going to say turd, the suspect comes in, uh, that suspect is going to take you out first. So I just think it's uh, it's not a smart practice, but if po persons want to do that because they, they think it's, uh, it's the way to deter somebody, to each his own. Yeah, but how many people... How many cases are there being where people have been able to defend themselves? Yeah, okay. The, I, I can't give you that stat. I don't know, but I can tell you this. On the on the situations where someone's being approached and they pull their gun out and tell the person to get back and the person leaves, you're gonna see very few of those reporting that to the police. We wouldn't even know those, we wouldn't even know those cases because they don't even want to get involved in the process of saying, why'd you pull a gun out? Did you, you know, were you gonna use it? Is it an aggravated assault? They just go, go on about their business. It happens all the time, just like with burglaries, just like with thefts. Many times those never get reported to us. I think with the new law, there's going to be a lot of people that have absolutely no training, doesn't know how to take care of a gun. And, and, and I just afraid that we see a lot of unfortunate situations. It, it, could, it could be a lot of unfortunate situations. Let me remind people of this, though. Prior to this, any of you did not have to have a license to carry a long gun down the street. You could have a you could have a rifle on your shoulder, and as long as you're not threatening someone with it, and as long as you're obeying the other laws, that that's completely allowed. The the the, the permit was only for persons carrying a handgun, but you could always carry long guns. And I just don't think you're we're going to have that many more people doing it. I hope not. Uh, the the problem with all this is that, and I told this to the committee that was considering it. I said. It sounds to me like y'all are trying to find a, a solution for a problem that we don't have. We had uh, um, like 28,000 crimes last year in, in, in the state of Texas that were adjudicated and only 113 of those people were LTC holders, which means that of the thousands of people who have an LTC, very few are the bad guys. And I can tell you that on a, on a traffic stop or a street encounter, if someone pulls out their license and their LTC, that was kind of a comforting feeling because you knew as a police officer, that person's already been vetted by the DPS. That person's a halfway decent individual. Uh, and, and now that we don't have that, we're going to be doing the vetting ourselves on the street that DPS was doing in advance. And at a time when people are asking for police officers to have less contacts with the citizens and shorter contacts with the citizens, this is going to make us have more contacts with citizens because people are going to call in, say, hey, there's a person over here with a gun. We can't simply say as dispatch, uh, hey, they're allowed to carry it. This permit was carried now. We're going to dispatch somebody over there, and we're going to have to have an encounter. And if they're the far right winger, they're going to get pissed that we're encountering them. And if they're the bad guy, there will be some type of problem with that person that that's, could possibly lead to deadly force. And I, I just don't think it was a smart move. But I didn't think concealed handgun license was a smart move either when it happened, and it didn't affect us at all. So I, I can't say that I'm, I'm going to be right on it because I was wrong the last time. Uh, this is Angelica. I have a question. After September 1st, can you still still get an LTC? Yes, you will still be able to get an LTC. And Senator Joan Huffman, great senator here in Houston, has put in a bill that's been passed that will remove the cost. So you no longer have to pay for the LTC after September 1st. It'll be free of charge because we don't want anybody saying this is some type of a, a poll tax or some type of tax to try to keep guns out of poor people's hands. Not the intent. She's, she's passed that. And the reason why I say you should still get one is remember, if you're going to travel to another state that has reciprocity with us, you're going to have to have that LTC. You can't just say, I'm from Texas. I don't have to have an LTC. No, if you're in that other state, they're going to take you to jail if that's required. So I, I would encourage people to still get the LTC. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, question. Uh, how is this affecting the commission on uh, law enforcement uh you know, standards and education. 
Yeah, that's what somebody was talking about when they said that I was a member of TCO, uh, Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Standards and Education. You probably hear it as TCO, or it used to be called uh, TCLOS. That mm -hmm. is just a state regulating agency that will regulate all the licenses for people in the state of Texas. There was a bill put forward, which is a TCO Sunset Bill, that was going to give TCO a lot more authority than they have now, kind of turn them into a pseudo internal affairs division. <laughs> That bill died, did not pass. So TCO's uh, responsibilities will stay exactly where they are now, which is basically making sure that I have my 40 hours of training every other year as a police officer, making sure that I've never been convicted of a class A misdemeanor or higher, and making sure that, that all of my records are in order. They're gonna continue with their same. And TCO, for those of you who don't know, TCO, all their members, there are nine of us. They're appointed by the governor, three civilians, three chiefs, and three line officers. I was a TCO commissioner from 97 to 2004. I was appointed by then Governor Bush, and I served my entire term. And now we have a, another Houston police officer who's on the board there. His name is Tim Whitaker. Uh, since TCO started, Houston has always had a person on TCO. Of the nine people, one's always been an HPD officer, which has been very good for us to have that uh, relationship with the state agency that regulates us. Thank you. Yes, sir. Joe, I have a question. Um, We've heard reports about uh, uh, many of the other uh, cities around the country that uh, defunded their police and, uh, and they're having astronomical crimes right now. Do you have any information about that? Yeah, what was interesting was um, a lot of folks who were opposing uh, HB uh, 1900 and SB 23, which were the two bills that, that were anti-defunding bill, they were saying that, look, nobody's defunded anymore. That used to be the talk, but nobody's doing that. Not true. Austin, Texas is still doing it. They're the only ones in Texas that I know of that's done it at the scale that they've done it. Uh, however, if you listen to the budget hearings on Wednesday here in Houston, speaker after speaker after speaker was calling for the defunding of police. So anybody who tells you it's not true, they're just not being honest with you. Fortunately, we have a mayor and most of our council members who don't buy into that garbage and they're going to continue to fund us to because they know who's who's out there keeping these streets safe. They know when you call 911 for a, a code one emergency that you're going to get a police officer there within three to five minutes. Not going to happen in Austin, Texas. Uh, Ray, would you uh, speak as well to the uh, no knock warrant uh, situation, please? Yeah, do you know the no knock warrant? Obviously, that came from the debacle on Harding Street where. Uh, we had one bad apple who lied about a warrant and uh, ended up uh, getting a lot of folks injured and uh, a person indicted for murder, which let me just tell you right now, that is the biggest joke ever for Kim Og to have indicted that officer for murdering those folks over there when, when the only person who should be charged with that is a person who lied on the warrant. That person believed every single thing that he was being told by his colleague, had no reason to doubt what that person was saying, Busted into that house in full uniform, saw two persons with weapons in there, pointing at officers, and ended up probably saving some of the officers in there. And now Kim Ogg has charged him with murder. Rusty Harden's representing him. I'm absolutely convinced he's going to be found not guilty. That was the biggest miscarriage of justice I ever saw. And uh, it, it's completely wrong. And I applaud our chief. I applaud our chief there who, who chose not to fire that officer. That officer is relieved of duty without pay pending the outcome of that trial, but he has not been fired because everything shows that he did what he was supposed to do. He, he trusted someone else who was somebody who's been on this department for over 30 years, had no reason not to trust him, and then that this happened. But the no-knock warrant, uh, the, the one that's probably going to pass, uh, that's probably going to be signed by the governor, is not going to affect us at all because it, it's going to mirror the policy that we created after the Harding Street policy, which is basically says we're not going to have no-knock warrants unless the chief of police or his designee says, I'm going to approve that no-knock warrant. And the only time that I'd ever use no-knock warrants, listen, I don't care if it's a dope house and I'm scared they're going to flush the dope down the toilet. Our officers are in too much danger when they do a no-knock warrant. But you can't say we're never going to have a no-knock warrant because when you've got a hostage situation and you've got somebody in there holding somebody at gunpoint, you can't knock on the door and say, we're coming in in three seconds. They're going to kill that hostage. You've got to be able to kick that door and move quickly in order to save that person. So should they be used? 
very, very seldom should a no knock warrant be used. Should it have been used on Harding Street? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would not have used that. The no knock warrant, unfortunately, sometimes was being used because officers didn't want to just sit there and wait it out. You can sit there and wait. And eventually, that person got to come outside to go to the grocery store, come outside to take the garbage out or something, and you can nab them in. But if it's a hostage situation, you got to be able to still do the no knock warrants. And that's exactly what's going to pass, which is our new policy, which I support it. If you're liberty to say, how would you compare uh, our new chief uh, uh, to our former chief? Well, let me say, both of them are very, very good friends of mine. Uh, there's no comparison as far as I'm concerned, as far as a, a, a street officer as Troy Finner. Troy Finner has been there. He worked his way up through the ranks here at the police department. He's lived in this community for his entire life. And uh, I have full respect for, for Troy Finner. Respected Acevedo too. It's just very difficult whenever you don't know all the players coming from another city or two other cities. Now he's at the fourth, which is Miami. But Art's a very good friend of mine. Um, I definitely like uh, Chief Finner as our chief now though. Uh, I'm sure we have some other questions. I got uh, a question if you don't mind. It's, it's kind of not as deep as some of the other ones that you've a answered today, Ray. Um, but my, my question is, and, and I'm fortunate enough, and I think most people in the room are, to, to live in probably safer, low-crime area neighborhoods, and I definitely attribute that to the law enforcement in our community. Um, the crime that, that my neighbors seem to have, and fortunately I haven't been a victim of this yet, is package theft. Um, do you guys have some kind of database uh, that all these video recordings from their Zoom cam or from their ring cameras and security cameras can be stored so that when you finally do catch that package thief, you're not just charging him with that one crime you caught him, but you can look back over all that video and, and charge him, you know, for all the crimes and, and, and really stick it to him. Uh, remember, I told you I can retire, so I won't be filtered. I'm just going to lay it out here. Uh, you're going to keep having those kind of thefts as long as you live in Houston, Texas. If, uh, if you don't want that, you're going to need to move to a smaller area like Bel Air or South Houston or somewhere where they have time to work those level of crimes. But when you're triaging the cases in Houston, um, as much as that thing that you got from Amazon is very, very important to you, it's really far down the totem pole when you're looking at the crimes that are being committed here in Houston, Texas. And, and the resources that are having to be put into the robbery division, into the, to the homicide division, into the human trafficking division, and burglary and theft just starts going lower and lower and lower. And uh, it's unfortunately rarely ever going to get investigated. Um, it may get investigated if it happens to be a, a, a jewelry store and there's, there's $4 million worth of jewelry delivered on their porch. So I'm not sure why you would do that, but if it was, that may make it over to the major offenders division, but otherwise they're going to continue. Um, I would simply say that, that you, you make contact with your neighbors, the person who's at home all the time. And if you're going to have a package delivered, I would suggest that you, you tell those folks that you're going to be getting a package today. Um, it, it's a big, big crime here in Houston and it's going to continue. It's right up there with burglary of a motor vehicle. Burglary motor vehicles are out of control. I promise you somebody on these screens that had their car broken into. And in most cases, it's because, yeah, most cases it's because you left something in plain sight, even if it was an empty bag or a bag of trash, but it happened to be in a target bag, these folks will break your window out to reach in there and get something like that. And if you own a truck, you're really likely to get your truck broken into because burglars know that most Ford pickup trucks, they have a gun hidden somewhere in that Ford pickup truck. Just, just, just telling you, we get hit all the time at Minute Maid Park whenever the, the Texans are playing because sporting events, you can't take your gun in. So they know that there's a lot of guns in those cars in the parking lot. So they will hit those individual places because they know they're there. Gyms, they know that your wallet and stuff like that is probably going to be hidden somewhere in the car. So it's a game. I, I, I'm on my wife all the time because she's like, but there's no money in that purse. It's an old purse. It's just sitting on the back seat. I said, okay. Then leave all the doors unlocked. Let them get in and get the purse. I don't want to have to pay for a window. If that's how you want to live, you live that way. Otherwise, nothing should be visible in your car. When those signs say take it, hide it, they're not lying to you. And you don't hide it after you park because there's people that we call shoppers that are sitting in the parking lot waiting for people just like y'all who are doing that kind of stuff. Oh, let me go put this back in there. They're watching you all the time to know what's going on. That's how the juggings take place. If you hadn't heard about jugging, 
People who go to the bank, they put, take money out of the bank, they come back out, somebody drives, and they may even be able to tell her. The teller may say, hey, this person just got $10,000 out of their bank account. Then you drive, they follow you. You go into HEB, you don't take that money with you. You take it and you hide it somewhere in your car. These turds know this. They wait for you to get out, they break the window, and they go through everything in your car. The seat pocket behind the front seat, the console, under the floor, floor mat, they know what you do. You're not the only one that does that. So just be very, very careful. If you're getting money out of a bank, go straight home. Don't, don't stop off somewhere because they will take the opportunity to hit you. Um, we, uh, Joe uh, or Kathy? Hey, before we do, one more thing, on, 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 especially when you're getting gas, please start doing this. When you get out of your car to get gas, you know how when you turn it off and open your door, all the doors come unlocked, take your keys out, lock your door, leave your side door open where you're getting gas, but somebody does a slider doesn't come up, comes right up next to your car, opens a passenger side while you're watching that that thing spin faster and faster as these gas prices are going up. You're looking at that, and they're getting in and getting your cell phone, they're getting your purse or anything else on your front seat, and you don't even know it. They're in and out 15 seconds. They're called sliders. Don't leave stuff like that. If you do, punch the lock whenever you're out pumping gas. Don't leave your car doors open. Sorry, Kathy, go ahead. Okay, so this whole topic of property crime. Okay, is it goes back to the observation we made before. We have fewer police officers now than we had 17 years ago, and yet the city has grown by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So where are the priorities of the police department? It's going to be on violent crime. They simply don't have the staff to do property crimes, and that's the reason that it's, it's getting to be more and more of a problem. Ray, I'm sure you can add to that. That's absolutely true. The, the property crimes are the ones that are triaged out at the very bottom. They're, the, they're the, the ones that go to the emergency room and has a stuffy nose. They're not going to take you when they got the person in cardiac arrest. Okay. Ray, can you comment on uh, the, the fight against human trafficking? Yes, big, big deal. Now, now, I will say this, that a lot of folks say that, you know, Houston's a hub for human trafficking. It has been for years. Part of the reason for that is we've been aggressively enforcing it. If, if you're not enforcing it in your city, you're not going to show that you have a lot of human trafficking going on. But when you're aggressively enforcing it, you get stats that show that, that this is what's taking place. Yes, these massage parlors, these uh, um, cantinas that have the girls in there dancing for money, um, there's lots and lots of that taking place. The topless, topless dancers, fortunately, we just, um, hopefully the governor's going to sign this. I see no reason why he won't, but they're saying now that any person working in the topless field has to go through the checks just like we do in, in someone who's in jail to make sure that this person's not, not here illegally, make sure everything's right on them, to make sure they're not, not trafficked in. Human trafficking is a big deal. Um, when, we do, when we do the busts on the massage parlors, we do find out that a lot of these folks are human trafficked. We do not charge them when that's the case, as long as they cooperate with us to get their bosses. But it's a it's a big, big problem that that we can't just keep putting blinders on. I mean, I've lived in Houston all my life and seen massage parlors here all the time. And you always just say, I don't even want to look at that. There's problems going on there. So when you hear us busting one of those places, it's not because we're trying to get some 18 year old girl who's trying to put herself through college to put her in jail. We're trying to make sure that people are there by their own choice and haven't been brought here from Thailand or somewhere else and are scared to death to leave because they've been frightened and told that if you leave here because you're not a U.S. citizen, they're going to pick you up and take you to jail. We laugh about that. We think, who would believe that? Someone from another country that's never been here. That's who would believe that. So yes, it does happen regularly. And these, these girls that they get here in the United States, get them hooked on drugs, get them hooked on alcohol, it, it's very, very difficult to get those folks out of it because even the ones that got in there unwillingly the first time, now they're so, that this is part of their culture now and their own drugs, they got to have that drug. They don't want to leave that person. So it's, it's a big problem. It's a problem that we're not going to stop fighting here. And I'll tell you in the legislature, there was bill after bill after bill talking about human trafficking. So they're getting it too. And I hope several of those bills get passed. Ray, <clears throat> There's a new policing policy, or I don't know exactly the title of it, but you already touched on the no-knock, I think, is in there. And I think there's, uh, there's uh, some other things in there, like pertaining to the body cameras and such, and there are other things, too. Would you kind of share with us sure. the content sure. of that? Sure. Um, the, the several things in the, in the mayor's executive order 
which now is probably going to be state law, most of these, a duty to render aid. If you see somebody who's, who's needing aid, that the police officer has a duty to render aid. Um, and the duty to intervene, if you see a police officer who's uh, using more force than necessary, that you have to intervene. Um, th those things are in the executive order. Uh, I have no problem with either one of those, uh, or the, the bar the chokeholds, which is going to be state law, uh, which we have no, we've never, ever taught chokeholds at the Houston Police Department. So the, the, the thing that you saw Derek Chauvin doing with his knee there, we, we don't teach that technique here. It's not, it's never been taught. So we have no problem in barring chokeholds. Now, let me just say this. It's barring chokeholds in a typical arrest. If you're in a fight for your life, I can, I can take a pin and punch your eyeball out. I can do whatever I have to do if I'm in a fight for my life. But a simple arrest, uh, you're, you're going to have to use only that force, which is absolutely necessary in order to execute that arrest. The problem that I had with the duty to, to uh, intervene, I think you should have a duty to intervene if you have the same set of facts as a person making the arrest. If I'm driving down the road and I see some officer on the side and he's striking somebody in the face, I can't jump out of my car and pull that officer out. What if he's doing that because that, office, that guy's got both hands on that officer's gun trying to pull out of his holster? I, I don't have the same set of facts that that officer does. But if it's my partner, I do have the same set of facts if we're seeing the same thing from the beginning until the time that I have to intervene. And, and that happens all the time. We've got officers frequently who bear hug other officers who are going in to attack someone because let's say that person sucker punched them during an arrest and took off running. Well, when you finally catch them, Human nature is what? To retaliate. But we know as police officers, we have to be a step above that. So we teach our officers, be your brother's keeper. If you, if you see somebody who's fixing to cross that line because they just got struck by that person, bear hug them, get them out of the scene, let somebody else take care of that suspect. Don't you let that person do it. Because as I used to train rookies, I'd say, you don't want to go to prison because of any turd's action. So just do what you have to do to make sure that you're only using that force necessary to execute the arrest. But as far as the mayor's executive orders, we think they were right on target with everything he said. We have no issues with them. Yeah, I elaborate a little bit on is the new executive order is going to include something about the body cameras. Is that right? Yeah, that, that one, though, really doesn't affect us as, as a police officer. It affects the city. And let me just tell you, um, I love the mayor, but they're going to fail on this. We've got an inferior product in our body cameras. We cannot get the, the, there's no way we're gonna be able to release the video at the time that his executive order says it has to be released. Not because we don't want to, our union, we want it released immediately. We don't have the technology here to do that. We don't have the equipment here to do that. It's not going to happen. Unless they get a quality company, we're one, we're one of the only major cities in Texas that doesn't use Axon, which is a taser company, which has the, the evidence.com, all the stuff in the cloud, able to retrieve it quickly, but it costs money. And they're not going to spend the money. They're going to keep on with the product that we have, which has been bought out now by Motorola. It was WatchGuard before. Now it's been bought out by Motorola. We're going to keep putting Band-Aids on it, keep putting Band-Aids on it, because that's the cheaper way to do it. Well, you're not going to be able to do what the public expects you to do, where they say, hey, I want to see Ray Hunt's video from two nights ago when he was involved in that shooting. Click, 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 boop, boop, here it is. Our, our technology that we have at the Houston Police Department ain't going to be the case. Our budget is, Joe knows, 92 93% personnel cost. Very little money do we get to use for other things besides personnel. So... Uh, we're just not going to have it unless we get some type of a crime control fee, public safety fee, something that says this money can only be used for upgrading our technology. Look, I would like to be like uh, Hunters Creek Village over here. They got a camera on every entrance there that runs the license plates of people who are coming in there, and it alerts them if that's a stolen car, if that car has warrants, and they can dispatch a unit to that. We, we don't have the money to do that kind of stuff here. We should have cameras all over this place. And, and I'm not talking about red light cameras. I know nobody likes those. But we've got cameras everywhere in this city, but we're, we, we don't have the technology to be able to retrieve that and do the things that we need to be able to do because there's just not money. We've got a finite pool of money, and we either are going to pay our people for what they're worth or we're going to get equipment, but we don't have the money to do both. And I know it's late, but uh, just one quick question. Yesterday, uh, Chief Finner spoke with my home Rotary Club, and uh, one of the questions was about the immunity issue for police. And they asked uh, what would happen if that goes into effect and basically would every police officer quit? 
I'm curious what your thoughts would be. Uh, they would definitely quit working. Whether or not they'd quit the force, I don't know. But they would definitely not be able be, be out there doing anything. And and the problem is that a lot of folks, even Texas legislators, believe that qualified immunity means that I'm I'm immune from being able to be prosecuted. It has nothing to do with criminal cases. Nothing to do with criminal. It's only civil about me getting sued. I would be sued by every single person I arrested if there was not qualified immunity. With qualified immunity, there's not an attorney out there that's going to take a case unless it's clearly egregious. And yes, you can sue a police officer if they're outside of their training from their department. But if they're within the training of their department, qualified immunity says you're not going to be able, you're not going to, be able to sue them. You're not going to be able to get anything. You can sue them, but the judge is going to throw it out under qualified immunity. So all it does is keep down those frivolous, frivolous lawsuits. It does not mean that someone can't sue me. If I go outside the, uh, the, the training of my department, they can sue me for everything I got. But if, if I'm within my training, they're not going to be able to sue me. I have that immunity. Thankfully, that all died in Austin. There's not many qualified immunity bills out of the Texas legislature. And I also believe, as much as I'm not a fan of, of Joe Biden, that he gets that part two and knows that I can't do this. I can't remove qualified immunity. He's got friends who are police officers, and he understands how important that is. But it has nothing to do with criminal cases. You can still get charged if you do something wrong as a police officer. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, well, Ray, thank you so much for that. Uh, I mean, it, it seems like it just flew by, and thank you for all of uh, that uh, great information. Yeah. Any of you have groups that you would like for myself or Doug Griffith, our president, to come in and talk to you in person, answer any questions? We're both we're an open book, we're transparent, we believe in transparency, and we have no problem in doing that. We we like getting out there and let the public hear exactly that we're just we're just regular folks trying to do a job to keep our city safe. Well, thank you, Ray. And yep. And, and Cho, thank you for being uh being part of our uh group today because you you brought uh, some insights uh, as well. So, Anytime. Take care. Joe, great seeing you, buddy. Okay. Thank See you. See y'all later. Thank you for inviting okay. me. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Well.